Hello, welcome to EMG Chapter 1, Video 3. This video is about 10 of the muscles we typically record from in the arm and hand during EMG work in the hand laboratory. Before we start though, it's important to realise two general points. First, this is not all of the muscles in the arm and hand. There are many more, we're going to mention a few of them. The ones we're focusing on are the ones that are easy to record from, close to the surface, so you can do surface EMG, and that are useful in the experiments we do in the hand lab. Second, it's important to know that when you record from a muscle, you're not just getting signals from that one muscle. You may be picking up signals from multiple muscles, different depths, different distances. And so it's important using surface EMG that you don't make strong claims about any particular muscle. A really good introduction and reference book is Cram's Introduction to Surface Electromyography, which is available in the hand lab and online and from any good bookstore, and hopefully also some of the bad ones. When you first plan to record from a particular muscle, it's important to do a little bit of background research. And this will involve a little bit of anatomy, but most of all, lots and lots of practice. First, check the book or online sources for where the muscle is, where it starts and ends, and what route it takes across the body. Second, learn what movements this muscle is particularly involved in. Third, practice finding the muscle on yourself and maybe on a very close friend. Palpate, which means feel and squeeze the muscle as you make the typical movements that it's involved in, as well as other movements that it's not involved in. Finally, practice recording signals from the muscle in the lab. We'll do more of that in the next video. When you know your target muscle very well and you can get good, clear signals from it in the lab, then you're ready to go. So here follows a list of the hand laboratory's 10 favourite muscles and where to find them. I should warn our viewers that there will be some naked man flesh in this video. However, we will try to avoid showing any nipple. The upper arm contains large, powerful muscles that move the arm around the shoulder and elbow and keep the whole arm stable. We're going to look at four muscles, the pectoral, deltoid, biceps and triceps. The pectoral muscle is large and powerful at the front of the shoulder, forming the upper part of the chest. It's responsible for rotating, flexing and bringing the upper arm forward, closer to the body. It's quite often hairy in men, so if you plan to record from this muscle, warn your participants and make sure you have a disposable razor ready. The deltoid is a large triangular muscle, hence the name, that forms a large part of the shoulder. There are three main divisions, the anterior, at the front, middle, or lateral at the side, and posterior at the back. The deltoid participates in lots of arm movements, but to get it working well in the lab, we usually ask participants to make movements like a chicken. The biceps muscle is in two parts, hence the name. It's large, powerful, and well known for flexing the forearm at the elbow. This allows you to lift heavy objects in your hand. It's very easy to see and find this muscle in the lab. The triceps is in three parts, hence its name. It's another large and powerful muscle which does the opposite movement to the biceps, extending the forearm. That covers the shoulders and the upper arm. Next, the forearm. The muscles of the forearm participate in moving the elbow and the wrist, but also in extending and flexing the fingers. In fact, a lot of finger movements are controlled by muscles positioned in the forearm, so don't ignore the forearm. This image shows a cross-section through the forearm. Imagine holding your left arm out in front of you with your palm facing upwards. This slice is taken through the middle of the forearm so it's like you're looking into your arm towards your hand. In grey, your radius bone is lateral on the left and your ulna bone is medial on the right. Here are the three main nerves of the arm in yellow. 
And here are the three largest superficial muscles of the forearm. We often record from these three muscles in the hand lab. The brachioradialis on the top left, which moves the elbow, and two muscles which move the fingers. The flexor digitorum on the top right, and the extensor digitorum on the bottom left. At this point, note how many other muscles there are in the forearm at least 11 other muscles from the ones I've just mentioned. These muscles move the wrist, fingers and elbow. Don't forget them, even if you're trying to record from the other muscles. The brachioradialis at the elbow helps to flex the forearm, for example when you're holding a cup of tea or shaking someone's hand. Don't confuse this muscle with the brachialis, which is on the other side of the elbow in the upper arm, underneath the biceps. The first of our muscles that moves the fingers, the flexor digitorum superficialis, or FDS, does exactly what the name implies. It flexes the four fingers and it is quite superficial in the forearm. It's also called flexor digitorum sublimis, and we just call it FDS. The extensor digitorum communis, or EDC, muscles on the other side of the forearm oppose the finger flexors and instead extend the four fingers. The hand doesn't have much space for muscles. Instead, a lot of tendons run into the hand from the forearm and operate the fingers remotely. But there are some very important muscles in the hand itself, and these are called intrinsic hand muscles. We're going to talk about three of the commonly recorded ones, from the thumb, the little finger, and the index finger. These three muscles in a group form the thenar eminence, the bulge of flesh on the palmar side of the thumb. It's quite hard to record signals from just one of these muscles at a time, so beware of claiming to isolate one of these with surface EMG recordings. These muscles flex and oppose the thumb against the other four fingers. They do really important work for manual dexterity. The penultimate muscle in this video, the abductor digiti minimi, moves the little finger away from the hand. This is an important movement when grasping a large object or opening your hand up to catch a ball. All five fingers can be splayed apart or spread out like this. And this is really the job of the intrinsic hand muscles, to move the fingers relatively independently from each other. There are four dorsal interosseous muscles. There are five digits with five bones in the hand. These bones are the metacarpals. Each neighbouring pair of metacarpals has an interosseous muscle. Interosseous means between the bones. The first interosseous muscle is the one between the thumb and the index finger. The second is between the index and middle fingers, and so on. There are also three interossei muscles on the other side of the hand. These are the palmar interossei. These are between the index and middle, the middle and ring, and the ring and little fingers. If you've been counting, there are seven interossei muscles. But for some reason, in psychology and cognitive neuroscience, it is the first dorsal interosseous, or FDI, that is the most commonly recorded from muscle. And this is likely because it's involved in moving the index finger, which is one of the five most important digits. The FDI moves the index finger away from the other fingers. And this movement is really useful for precision and power grips, for fine manipulation, for catching balls, and all sorts more. The FDI is also very easy to find on the hand. It's quite isolated, so the signals are usually very good. It is just large enough to get two electrode pads on, but it's not so large that you don't know where to put them. Indeed, the FDI is kind of like the Goldilocks muscle. It's not too large or too small. It's just right for getting good EMG signals, even for beginners. 
but you should be wary of choosing to record from the FDI just because it's easy. Unless you're doing a very generic motor study, you should take care to make sure that the, the muscle you're recording from in your EMG is actually involved in the behaviour that you're studying. And this is not always obvious. For example, muscles with flexor in their name are very often also involved in extension movements. And that's because muscles work in antagonistic pairs. But it's not the case that when one flexor is active, the extensor is silent. In fact, during an extension movement, the flexor could be even more active than the extensor. That's so that it can stabilise the muscle, counteract the forces and oppose it. One good example of when to be cautious is in finger tapping. Lots of neuroscience and psychology studies use finger tapping as a very simple model movement to activate the hand area of the brain or in timing or other domains. Lots of studies also record from the FDI muscle. And sometimes finger tapping studies also record EMG from the FDI muscle. But if you place your hand flat on the table with the palm down and relax it, then you can actually tap your index finger very well without really using the FDI muscle at all. By contrast, if you rotate your hand a little so that the thumb and the index finger are at the top, and then tap the finger again in the same direction, but this time under a little bit of tension, then the FDI will start to be involved in this movement. So be warned. That's all I want to say about muscles. You're going to see a lot more muscles being recorded from throughout Mooch. In the next video, we're going to look at EMG electrodes, how to place them over muscles, and how to get good signals.